This is Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak of Columbia University saying a few words about Hari Garuba. I will miss Hari Garuba. We didn't meet often, but our conversations were always serious, concerned with the diversity of post-colonial work, the variegated landscapes of continental and southern Africa, of southern Asia. I was always impressed by the gentleness accompanying his astute brilliance, his quiet sense of humor, and his generally calming personality. Before I had met him, I had read his book of poetry and his piece on animism in public culture. My own feelings about, and I quote myself, the secret of the Dvaita structure of feeling, the unanticipatable emergence of the supernatural in the natural, the tenacious dog on the mountain path, suddenly King Dharma or Yudhishthira in the last book of the Mahabharata, rather unlike any sustained notion of incarnation, as I wrote in Moving Devi, resonated very strongly with his thoughts. And I now quote the famous phrase that have really been used by so many people, written by Harry, about, I quote, the animist unconscious, which operates through a process that involves a continual re-enchantment of the world with the differences appropriate to the different contexts of Harry's and my own. Reading Kofi Aunor's lines, there was the story of the people of the sun who came one noon harvest time to steal farm produce. A farmer surprised them, cut the ropes and marooned them on earth. They are still here light and red as the earth, the men from the sun. I remembered Harry's beautiful lines from Water Song. Now she sets out with a sway of songs on her hips, bearing a bounty of fruits between her lips. Why does the wind worship her? Why does the sun court her with jewels? Reading these, I thought again of the diversity within quote, African positions, that the monolithic imagination of the Euro-US liked to obliterate. In this spatial history, the difference between Garuba and Auna is not just between moods and styles and individual poets. I also read Harry's piece on Ken Saroviva, especially because Saroviva was an extremely important example for many of us thinking about post-colonial corruption inherited from an absence of the practice of freedom in colonialism. He was important for those of us who, following Franz Fanon's chapter 3 in The Wretched of the Earth, suffering as the bourgeois movements that brought in negotiated independence slowly lost their hold on the imagination of the leadership. Quote, the genocide of the Ogoni, unquote, as Harry wrote, that takes its place with the genocide of the Rohingyas today is movingly described by Garuba as he mourns, and I quote again, this silenced, marginalized minority who were not only being physically decimated as a people, but who had also been representationally erased from national and international consciousness. His words hold power for the current situation around the globe. I quote him again, privileging culture over and above the material practices which create those cultures. He thought, I quote, the advent of post-structuralism led to this kind of sclerosized culturalism. Rescuing Derrida's fierce critique of Eurocentric culturalism 
from his niche marketing today has become part of my obligation to that other d dead friend of mine. I found Harry's text because it was in a volume edited by my dear friends, Abdul Rashid Nahalla. And equally, as I was navigating the Oxford Encyclopedia of African Thought, edited by my friends, Abiola Irele and Biodun Jaifo, I came across Harry's good entry on Anglophone literary criticism, critical of the culturalist anthropological versions of Africa that are still being taught and mindful of womanism. In the unfinished work, Beyond the Postcolonial, Language, Translation, and the Making of African Literature in English, that he leaves behind, Garuba writes, and I quote, most, if not all, African literary texts in English are always already determined by an absence, a lost origin which the text seeks to restore even while recognizing the impossibility of such a restoration. This then is the post-colonial muse that haunts African writing, that it is a writing that seeks to restore an origin or original which, because of its absence in the language of the text, has to be continually simulated. Here again, my thoughts of history as lost object resonates very strongly with Harry's intuition. The past, in a ceaseless series of strategies of simulation, making and unmaking the vanishing present. Personally, the loss of a friend and colleague, younger by many years, with a good deal of work left ahead of him, has a bitter poignance for those of us who have gone further along the way. Harry Garuba now belongs to his readers. May he be read well.